Well, I don't think so. I mean, I think what has happened in Iowa with the judicial system is that um, the fire has jumped over the uh, f- threshold or the, 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 the fire breach, and um, there is now a, a completely political discussion on the part of some people about um, uh, appointing and, um, and keeping justices not only in the Iowa Supreme Court, but there has even been discussion this week about launching a campaign to unseat justices and judges all the way up and down the judiciary unless they meet certain litmus tests that you get them to uh, um, basically answer a questionnaire. And if they answer wrong, then you launch a campaign against them um, in, in the, in, in the uh, retention election. And I think that is a different environment from what we have had before. And when you have a system where judges are appointed and then come up essentially for reappointment by voters, um, the system works until it becomes highly politicized. And I think that's where we are at now. I don't at all, because uh, the last uh, effort to basically remove ju- uh, justices based on a single ruling um, was very successful, and everyone was amazed, and I think there's nothing like the taste of blood or success to make you simply want to continue down that road. And there are some very conservative groups and leaders in Iowa, and, and a lot of Iowans are uh, quite conservative, and so um, I think this is going to now be tested in, in the next round, and it's already being tested in the sense that uh, conservatives are pushing Governor Branstad to um, basically impeach the justices that are left. Branstad has said he's not going to touch that one. Um, and an effort to basically change the uh, judicial appointments uh, board, which is uh, has a large number of members appointed by um, the um, um, law community um, and put more, quote, ordinary citizens on that board, um, that's going to be an, uh, or is already an interesting political struggle. So we're, we're seeing a, a highly political debate going on in an area that normally was left a little bit more to, quote, the experts, which would be, peop- you know, the, 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 the legal community. He won't be remembered very much because if you ask most Iowans at the mall about governors, you know, a few decades back, they don't have a clue who they were, what they did. Um, His legacy is going to be in history books um, for others. And in in a few years, um, no one will actually really remember who he was or what was going on. Um, You know, one-term governor... You know, in the short term, he will be remembered as a governor who managed not to put forth the sort of successes and the efforts that he was making to uh, bring recovery from floods, to stem the the tide on a collapsing economy and try to, um, you know, create jobs both with Iowa resources and with, with federal stimulus money and did so fairly skillfully. But managed to be defeated because his administration was racked by all kinds of scandals and problems in uh, administrative agencies that uh, overshadowed the, you know, the successful leadership that he offered. And I think it'll be, uh, you know, if nothing else, a mixed record. And a record, don't forget uh, the reason he lost the election and lost it fairly decisively, of um, often awkward leadership, I would call it. I don't want to be any meaner uh, or more critical than that, but uh, having somewhat of a tenure, not showing up for disasters the minute they occurred and offering leadership there, um, having um, a little bit of a reputation of a short temper that turns some people off, and, uh, you know, I think it'll be a mixed record at best. Well, I mean, there, there, there was a lot of um, brutal language um, in, in races. I don't have in front of me exactly which races they were, but certainly 
the congresswoman herself uh, was in a fierce race. Uh, and Arizona is, in fact, the Wild West of the United States. And uh, this is well known. It's not a secret. The Arizona legislature has been uh, uh, in waves, uh, making it easier to carry firearms and carry them in in many different locations. And therefore, you know, that entered into the race in Arizona, but more generally in the United States, there was a lot of, let's just call it, uh, if nothing more than impolite and often uh, fairly brutal language used in, in races where uh, candidates actually had featured firearms in their commercials, shooting at cap and trade. Um, Sarah Palin put a clearly a, a, a target, um, a gun target, a rifle target over uh, Democrats running for Congress that were targeted for defeat, and uh, Congresswoman uh, Gillibrand was one of them. And so there was, uh, I think, a higher level of, um, uh, of brutality in the elections. It was one of the nastiest elections in my memory, in 40 years of studying politics, and that, in, that by elections I mean all of across the country. There, there, there were people who, one radio talk show woman in Florida who was um, supporting one of the candidates, Republican candidates for Congress, and subsequently he said he didn't want her to be a staff person, actually does her radio show with, I think it's a 38 special, um, sitting right on next to her microphone, and talks about it frequently, you know, a chick with a gun and so on. So, you know, that's where we are in the United States in terms of the political rhetoric, people shouting, you lie, when President Obama gives his State of the Union address, presidents, sh people shouting, um, you know, he's not uh, a citizen or a naturally born citizen. Just recently when the members of Congress were reading through the Constitution and got to the part that defines what the uh, requirements are for running for president. Those are, those are things that don't happen very often, and we saw that all over the country, and I think it made it, it, made it uh, legitimate for people to attack individuals and to attack the government as a whole, which was often painted as being an evil thing and the enemy of the American people. Uh, and, and I think that sets the, the tone for a discussion of, the country, of, of issues in the country. It doesn't necessarily give instructions to people to go out and kill people the way uh, the radio show in Rwanda, uh, Radio Mil Colin, did during the uh, Rwandan massacre where they actually gave instructions from the radio station and told people where to go to massacre people in churches and markets and so on. Uh, we, we were not there yet. The New Hampshire legislature, as their first act, the new Republican supermajority there, um, made it easier for people to bring firearms to the state house and carry them, including people in the gallery in the state house. Uh, my former student and uh, and right hand person to uh, Arizona Governor Napolitano, who is now the head of Homeland Security, sent me a couple of emails this morning. One of them is about the in amazing increase uh, in uh, gun sales, especially the um, 33 round magazine uh, Glock uh, right in the aftermath of this shooting. And uh, State Representative um, Al uh, Balsadero of New Hampshire said um, the reason New Hampshire is the safest state in the country is because a lot of us carry firearms and that's how you make things safe. And a new state senator, Lori Klein, uh, in Arizona, brought a special guest to the uh, Arizona State Capitol on Monday. Um, the article in the Arizona Republic says, and it was her 38 special, which she carries in her purse. She says, I pack. Our safety is our personal responsibility. So I guess that seems to be the early evidence of what the results are of the shooting um, is that people are going out and buying additional firearms because 
this proves how dangerous this country is and that you'd better be able to protect yourself or be able to protect others. Uh, there's even a discussion in Arizona about uh, allowing firearms, uh, professors to carry firearms and allow students to carry firearms at uh, colleges and universities. So uh, I think, I'm not sure, I am not sure that this is going to lead to a discussion about increased uh, gun regulation when the whole trend in the United States, including Iowa, which had a uh, an interesting um, firearms law. Uh, you, you know, you had to go to the sheriff, and the sheriff really had to sort of decide whether you might be a risk or not. It was pretty tough to get a permit to carry a concealed weapon county by county, and Paul Fitzgerald of Story County was apparently the most um, diligent in scrutinizing people. Story County was one of the hardest counties to get a permit to carry a concealed weapon. That's all gone now. You can go in, you can buy the firearms, which is pretty easy to do anyway. All you do is go to the sheriff's office and they run a little short background check on you and give you a piece of paper and you go down to the gun shop and start charging up on your MasterCard. And then you can go in now to the sheriff's office and get that permit to carry that concealed weapon and, and carry a weapon in a lot of different places. So I'm, I don't see any real sort of reversal of that particular trend, frankly. Because I grew up in a country that had extremely rigid gun control laws in Colombia, South America. I was born there, grew up there. You were not allowed to own a gun, and the only place you could, you know, it was very difficult to get a permit, and the only place you could buy ammunition was from actually from military bases. The only place. Everybody in Colombia had a gun, and you could buy ammunition from about four guys on each corner of the main plaza of Cali, Colombia, my hometown. And so you know, uh, laws and enforcement is also a function of the culture. And we have laws against illegal drugs, and yet you can buy them in any town in the United States 24-7 uh, because the culture of the society is permissive on them. And I think there is, there is in American culture something that says that gun ownership and the right to carry firearms and buy ammunition is kind of the American way and, and if you pass tough gun laws, you can still buy guns. You know, that's why bad guys always have guns. They don't have a permit, and they didn't buy the ammunition in a legitimate place, but they have lots of firearms. And it, it just it seems to me that it is sort of a pervasive thing, and probably the safest place for you to be is to work at the cafeteria at an airport, you know, because that's one of the places where they don't let you carry guns and ammunition in, and we do have severe gun control the minute you walk into an airport and try to go through that security line, um, but we don't have much of that in other places. Um, in, in, in countries like Colombia, you have metal detectors, and they frisk you, and the pat-down that the TSA does, they do it in almost every major government office building because so many people carry firearms, and, pe and so you work in secure environments, but everybody is armed, and, and you know, that's a tragedy, I think.